Okay, everyone, we're, we're going to make a start. Thank you so much for coming down to our first ever East Kent Coast Photography Exhibition. I hope you've had a nice time looking around. We've got some really amazing photos that have incredibly difficult for us to kind of narrow down, but these are the selected ones from what we had entered. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to the Crowd Museum for hosting us in this lovely space. <laughs> Also, thanks to Bannock Coast Project for co-hosting. It's been really lovely to work together and it gave us a chance to kind of look at the whole of the marine environment we've got here and not just focus on birds. So basically, we're going to start with a few talks. Greg's going to begin and then we'll move on and do some awards afterwards. So. Yes. Um, there are a few chairs if anyone is uh, wanting to sit down. We've got two chairs there if anyone wants that. But yes, thank you for all for coming. And what I'm going to uh, tell everyone is actually about the Daring Dozen. And uh, there are 12 um, species of bird that we focus on. And uh, we've got a number of them here and a category that was a part of it. So the photos that were just over there um, at the other, uh, other side and also the turnstone that uh, is on your right or left hand side, my right. Um, so we get the turnstone, which, um, which is just over there, the sandling and the oyster catcher, they're all um, in the images there. But we also get a number of other ones, I'm going to try and remember them all. Golden plover, ringed plover, uh, grey plover, lapwing, uh, purple sandpiper, red shank, uh, curl you. there's two more. Turnstone. Got turnstone. <laughs> <laughs> Got to <curl> you. <laughs> Dunlin. Red Shank. So yeah, we, we've got we've got a number of them. I think that's all of them. Uh, yeah, try and find the leaf. But um, these species are so important. We call them daring dozen because of the massive distance that they've travelled. So they're going to be travelling to up to about three thousand miles. So it's massive, and especially as a number of these species are so tiny. One of them is actually about 14 centimetres. So that is tiny, and that's the Dunlin. So that is absolutely massive, like massive journey that it's going to take from such a small bird. So the turnstone, we're, we really focus on because they have dropped dramatically recently. And they actually come from Canada. The ones that we see right now are from Canada. And they've come all that way, so that is about 3,000 miles because they go to northern Canada. And between us and Canada, there's no stopover. So if you think about it, that's a whole journey that they have to make. And that takes them about three days and three nights. So it's a long journey. I can't do that. Um, it's, so they actually have to try and cut off part of their brain. So shut off one side and use one, and then vice versa, just to make it all that way. But while they're here, they need to try and fatten up. So they have to try and triple their weight while they're here. And that is really impressive. So when they start coming to here around September time, you see them, they're really skinny because they've flown all that way. And um, when they are going to be leaving in about a month's time, all of them should be gone. There may be a few staying in Viking Bay um, down to them being not sexually mature yet. So you have the potential of seeing them there but you can see how much bigger they are. And that one on the side there is actually quite a large one, so it's probably been fattening up quite a bit, because they can uh, probably eat, there's a potential of them eating about 70 different crustaceans and different insects in a minute. So that's more, more than one a second, so that is amazing. So we've got all these different species. So I'll, I'll go on to the sandling. So the sandling also, they go from Iceland, um, and they have this massive journey going all the way north and sometimes they go to a different place like Scandinavia but they're one of our smallest waders that we get and we can kind of tell, uh, tell them apart they look very similar to Dunlin and many people will get that wrong so basically they're very grey on top and quite a light grey and the Dunlin are a bit brownish but they've got black legs like you can see on the photo um, over there and um, then we've also got the oyster catchers. That was uh, another great photo. And that was actually um, from, so they come from Russia, and that's northern Russia. Um, and that's about 3,000 miles as well. 
So it's a massive journey, and they're a little bit larger, the oyster catchers. You can tell uh, that they're oyster catchers because of their black and white and their red beaks and red legs. But the only thing is, they're misnamed. So oyster catchers, so you would think that they'd eat oyster catch oysters. Um, but actually, they can't even get through the oysters. They're too tough for their beaks. So they eat many different uh, creatures, such as periwinkles. They'll go and eat those, um, different razor clams, different things like that. And they'll probe with their massive beaks. And these birds have just come here to try and rest up. So they're all only here for the winter time. So all of those birds come here, and that's why we see so many of them. And that's why we had uh, a full a category for them is because of their importance and of why we've got our jobs here is because we need to try and protect them because they are going down in numbers and that is down to disturbance. So human disturbance is the main factor that we believe is causing them to go down. There are many different factors like climate change but we've put it down to uh, humans and so whenever you go on a nice walk, if you're taking your dog on a walk, you're going along the beach or if you go kite surfing, uh, jet skiing, all of that, if you get too close to them, then they have the potential of flying. And when they're flying, they're not having that time to either feed or rest, and they're actually using up those fat stores that they need to travel to all these different places. Um, so what, what we say is basically try and keep away uh, from them. So if you see them, observe them from afar. Binoculars are perfect, or look through a camera, of course. Um, but if you could try and go uh, walk around uh, low tide, it's probably best. High tide, they're too close to you, so you can disturb them really easily. But if it's low tide, then they're so far away from you, then you can observe them from afar and have such a big area uh, to play with, and you've got all that beach. So we're going. So that's what we ask uh, of everyone. But uh, so that is me done for the daring dozen. And I believe it is Tony next. Um, but is, has anyone got any questions uh, about anything I've, I've said? Anything about the Darren Dozen? Any birds? Just in general? But uh, if, if anyone's got any questions, or oh, I did so well and I told everything that I needed to. No? So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Tony Child, he's the Marine Officer uh, around Thanet, and also Thanet Coast Project's Head Lead. So I'll leave you with him. Thank you. Um, we're really <coughs> lucky to be um, a part of this exhibition as well, of helping to lead this. The Thanet Coast Project itself has been around for 20 years and it's really been put in place because of local people wanting a wildlife related project to do with our coastline here. We're really lucky enough to actually live on the, the longest continuous stretch of coastal chalk in the country. It's also internationally and nationally important for a number of things. Bird life, as Greg's just gone over, in particular is one of the most important sides of it. It's got international designations for the bird life here, but also because of the different features associated with the chalk reef. Well, the chalk reef itself is home to lots of different wildlife. It's um, home to um, lots of algae communities down the far end of the beach at the very low tide, to lots of life on the shore. And it's our best semi-natural habitat around here. It's a part of the planet which you can't really build on and hasn't been too affected by sort of human impact. Today, though, we're looking at sort of photo um, competition here. Um, I'm really pleased with the fact that, that so many people have entered into this competition because it's given us really an impression of, of um, around our coastline. I'm one of the people who are sort of really passionate about sort of the, uh, things like the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. And I'm so pleased that we've managed to actually produce this sort of as a local aspect around here because it gives us a chance to actually for um, us to see some of the things which have of importance around here. 
Some of these are sort of snapshots in time, and some of the pictures which we've seen here today are absolutely amazing. And I was a part of the judging panel on here, and I must admit, we really struggled to actually get some of um, the winners of, of, from this competition because some of the categories were so high that it was extremely hard to actually um, judge and sort of put ones forward. But I'm really pleased today that we've got the winners actually here um, and, and being able to actually sort of give the awards to the winners. It's the case of that Thanet is probably underestimated for its sort of um, the coastal assets it has. They are internationally and nationally important, and we're very lucky to, to have these around. Um, the Thanet Coast Project itself is actually supported by volunteers, and the volunteers, there's a number which are here, and you, you ever see people in these turquoise t shirts around, you know that there's a volunteer around. Um, because they have been instrumental in helping the project sort of really get, um, put out the word about how important our coastline is. And there are some leaflets around, I think in particularly in the winner's room there's a whole pile of these ones around. And it's a chance to actually see some of these sort of animals for real life. There are sort of features on things like seashore safaris for anyone who hasn't been on the seashore safari. And a chance to actually get up close to some of our marine wildlife. Um, with the help of volunteers who run these events, and it's a chance to actually sort of see all the different types of native crabs, which is going to be a nice link to the, the crab museum <laughs> a minute on there, because um, we we literally have quite a few different types of species which are around, which I think many people are probably not aware of, that we have things like porcelain crabs and hairy <coughs> crabs and lots of tiny crabs which you're more likely to oversee on the shore, whereas you might be more familiar with things like the edible crab or the shore crab, which are sort of ones which are a lot long, larger around to see. So, um, do pick up a leaflet. There are different things from geology walks to um, a Great British Beach Clean to a Seaweeds and Their Secrets sort of walks which are held in the summer. And they're all run by experts on those sides, so it's a case of um, a chance to actually find out a lot more about some of our wildlife. So, I'm going to end at that particular point, so we've got a chance to actually hear from the Crab Museum as well now. So, um, I'm looking at the stunned audience, and so I'm hoping there's no questions at the moment, May. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, one third of the Crab Museum, so there's two other directors as well. Uh, we started here, but. Um, I'm going to change from our regular schedule to talking about crabs, talk a little bit about birds as well. Uh, but I will warn you, one of the other directors has actually wrote this and was meant to do it tonight, but he has a stomach bug. So please don't ask me very specific questions about this at the end. <laughs> Just because I have a clipboard and a, like, a branded fleece does not mean I know what I'm talking about right now. Uh, but here we go anyway. So, what are birds? Well, they fly. Well, they don't all fly, and so do other things fly as well. They are warm-blooded, but so are lots of other things. They do lay eggs, but then so do other lots of things as well. They have feathers. Now, this is a good one, because lots of extinct reptiles had feathers, and fan worms have feathers around their mouths as well. So there's no simple definition of what a bird actually is. We all understand what we mean when we talk about birds, but that says more about our human languages than it does about birds. So scientists, they classify birds as a type of dinosaur. Only a living type of di the only living type of dinosaur, but dinosaurs are of course reptiles, which makes birds a type of reptile. So crocodiles are more closely related to birds than other reptiles like snakes. But then what are reptiles? Cold-blooded. They're cold-blooded animals that lay eggs. But birds are warm-blooded, and some reptiles don't even lay eggs. So, the closer we look at birds, the less sense they make. And other categories, like reptiles, start making a bit less sense too. Other organisms as well are similarly messy. So, like plants. What are plants? <laughs> Supposedly, they're organisms that photosynthesize that aren't animals or fungi, or bacteria, or viruses, or anything else. So plants evolved from a single-celled pro oh God, protozoa, again, don't question me on any of this, uh, <laughs> that happened to engulf a photosynthesizing bacteria, 
and they evolved from there into trees and flowers and so on. So plants actually started off as two separate things inside each other. Can we still describe them like that though? Lichen too. They're a hodgepodge of fungi, bacteria, and lichen aren't even one thing, but a bunch of things living together symbiotically. Uh, so some plants, like types of orchid, don't actually th photosynthesize at all and just get all their nutrients from networks of fungi below the ground. And it isn't even just plants that photosynthesize. There are some types of sea slug called leaf sheep that photosynthesize too. Plasmodium, the parasite <laughs> that causes malaria, used to photosynthesize. The chloroplasts are still there, but they're no longer used to make the energy from light. They do, however, store lots of genetic info that malaria needs to survive. So in the distant, distant past, malaria <coughs> was also a plant. So you can do this with pretty much anything. So what this rambling set of observations is getting at is out there <coughs> in the real world, there is no such thing as birds or reptiles or plants or lichen. <laughs> there is just varying degrees of complexity that has evolved alongside, among and inside other things. So in that sense, birds as we know, really are just exist in your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> so while science can describe the world, it's worth thinking about the words used to describe <coughs> science as well. So, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think we are moving on to the awards now as well. Um, uh, but yes, as well, thank you very much again for Bird Lies and uh, Thanic Coast Project. You would think birds being a natural predator of crabs, we wouldn't get along, but we've got along pretty well actually. Um, so thank you and let's uh, get ready for the awards as well. Woo! Good evening everyone. How are we all? Excellent. Um, so we're going to move on to the awards now, um, so first we're going to go through all the categories, there's, as um, I think Tony said, there's lots of deliberation over most of these awards, and it took them quite a while to, to get through them all, but I think we've come up with a pretty good selection of what we, what we had, and there was loads more we probably could have displayed as well. So, we've ended up having extra um, photos in for that reason, so we've got some highly commended ones which you may have noticed around the room. Uh, we had lots of entrants, and they're all absolutely brilliant, and it's been so special for us to go through them all and see how much people care about their coastline, and just how incredible it is. <coughs> so we move on to our first awards. So this is the under-12s category. You've got the... Where are they? <laughs> so our runner-up for the under-12s is Chloe Berry. And our winner for the under 12s category is not on that page. Where's she gone? Very good. <laughs> is Mirabelle. <laughs> cool. So the next category was the 12 to 18s, which actually was probably the most difficult category for us to decide. We had some really incredible entrants, so we were totally like blown away by the fact that um, that category was especially incredible. We actually ended up having two highly commended. As they were anonymous, we didn't realise at the time that they were the same two people. So we've got four awards for the same two. But, um, so, the first highly commended was for Jenny Allen. Congratulations. And then also for the brilliant laughing goals is Hunter Herbert. I'm just 
going to make you come up and do the same thing. <laughs> um, so then the runner-up, which was the lovely turnstone, which was especially lovely for us because we are obsessed with turnstones, uh, Jenny Allen. Well, so. <laughs> And then the winner, which is an incredible photograph of a little egret, which is in the other room there, mm. was Hunter Herbert. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well done, it's really good. Okay, our next category is coastal landscape. Um, this category was for any photo showing the magnificent <coughs> coastline and it had the highest amount of applicants by a long way. We're not surprised because obviously we have a very beautiful coastline here in Bennett. So our runner-up for this category was a photo that shows a lovely long expo the exposure even of the old derelict pier at Home Bay. So it's this one here, which is brilliant because it's now used as a roosting site largely for cormorants and shags. The long exposure helps us to see the sea look really soft and the colors look incredible. We also loved the gold captured on the post. Congratulations to Phil Bloxham. <laughs> and our winner in this category isn't um, here with us today, but we'll give her a round of applause anyway. So this image incorporates the East Kent Coast sunsets that we're famous for. We love the little figures out on the street at Whitstable. So it's this, this one here. And that was for Jacqueline Bell. Okay, and next we have the Daring Dozen, which we're all about. So we love the Daring Dozen category and was again really challenging. So we ended up having a highly commended one for this category as well. So well done to Mark Hilner, which was the oyster catchers. Just shows them colours so striking against the waves and flying supremely low as they often do. We don't get to see them that close up normally. I don't know if Mark is here today, but congratulations. <laughs> And then the runner-up was a fantastic photo of a sandaling really close up running along the beach. And they, walk, um, they run so fast, so we were just very impressed that they could catch it in that kind of crisp, beautiful photo, which was Tony Flashman. <laughs> and the winner, which was a beautiful photograph of a curlew, uh, maybe slightly insensitive as we're in the Crab Museum because it is about to have a tasty beef <laughs> on a crab, um, was John Draper. So, well. <laughs> Apologies, Chris. Sorry, we've shifted things around earlier. Uh, so our next category is coastal wildlife, and this category is open to any coastal wildlife that you see along the coast. Um, we had a wide variety of images, including seals to house sparrows, kingfishers, and herons. So there is a picture of a seal that you may have seen, which is just just there on the wall. So our first award is for a highly com another highly commended image, and this image is incredibly beautiful, aptly showing a reed bunting amongst the reeds. So it's just behind oh. Tony there. <laughs> we absolutely love the orange colours captured here. They effectively use the rule of thirds. So if you're a photographer, you know, you know what that means. <laughs> With the eyes of the bird looking into the open space, making you follow its gaze. And that picture was taken by Tracy Mantle. And our runner-up in this category um, was the, we all, the seal photo, the lovely seal photo here. So we always love seeing the seals on our coastline and thought this photo was especially effective as they're looking straight at the camera, making it a very powerful shot. And that was taken by Paul Stone. And our winner for this category um, took an amazing photo and we were amazed to see such a majestic animal taken at the perfect time right when it was hovering between the hole on the Recolver Towers. 
It's this one just behind Greg here. <laughs> what absolutely perfect timing, and with the Kestrel, perfect and crisp. And it's named Right Place, Right Time, and I think it's a very apt name for it. And this was by Jane White. Okay, and the next category was good coastal conduct. So this could be anything from sort of following the coastal codes or kind of just generally taking good care of our coast, going out litter picking, all these things. So we had some really interesting um, different um, entrants for this one. So the runner-up is someone <coughs> doing a great effort of clearing up right by Walpole Bay. And I know people often go out in big groups as a um, rise up clean up group. And I think she mentions that in her bio. So that's Harriet Hunter. <laughs> And then the runner-up, who I think isn't here this evening, uh, was a really lovely shot of the Lido Sands uh, being cleaned up, and we thought it really just captured the community spirit of going out and doing these things as a group, and that's Lee McKenzie. Alice Spencer say winner there. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even realise <laughs> So on the flip side of that, our next category is human impact. Um, we really hoped that this category would raise awareness of the impact that uh, we as humans can sometimes have on our coastline, causing devastation on our coastline such as litter and um, the other sort of things you see on the coastline disturbance being one of them that Greg spoke about earlier. Uh, the runner-up for this category shows us a shocking photograph showcasing brilliantly the impact that we are having along our coastline by our day-to-day -day activities. Captured in Ramsgate Harbour, we can see how much litter is often built up there, and I love that she questions in her bio, would you swim in this? And this is by Maria Gilbert. Our winner for this category was another photograph that shows the mess that humans often leave along the coast. We thought this was especially effective as it shows the turnstone and sandling unknowingly feeding right next to many things that we call rubbish. Unfortunately, they have to live amongst these um, things in their habitat, often causing injury or worse. Well done to Monique, Man I can't, I'm going to get your name wrong, I'm so sorry, Man Mansion. <laughs> And we finally just want to uh, really congratulate our overall winner, which was of the fantastic curlew catching a crab in mid flight. We just thought it was absolutely astounding. So, a huge well done to John Draper, our overall winner. Well, that's, that's everyone. That's all of our awards. Thank you so much to everyone that entered. It was incredibly difficult for us to go through all the photos, but we really felt that these really represented our coastline and stood out to us as just being exceptional. So thank you, everyone, for there was a power ban for entering the photos. We will be reopening the competition in September, so keep your eyes out and please do enter any photos again or any new photos that you take. And yeah, continue to have a look around. We'll be here for a little while and there's, there's drinks at the back bar if you'd like anything.